The second half of the season is upon us. Or for those that want to get technical, the last quarter, the post-All-Star break, the time to make that playoff push. But through 61 games, the LA Clippers, who are picked by many to win the title, are only five games over 500. Why have the Clippers been a disappointment so far this season? I'm going to be answering that question on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Vaziri, in my 18th season as a Clipper fan. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. And of course, subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for more Clipper content. I will have a video after Russ's game, at Russ's debut. And of course, Locked On Clippers is free and available on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And it's also on YouTube where I want you to comment today's pin question of the three reasons that I'm about to name for why the Clippers have had a disappointing season thus far. I want you to tell me which one you think is number one. Before I tell you what those three are as we divide the episode, I'm going to be talking to you about that this episode is sponsored by FanDuel and FanDuel is the new official sports betting partner for Locked On. So go to FanDuel to place all your bets for the second, or should I say the last quarter of the NBA seasons, but let's get right into it. There's three major reasons, in my opinion, why the Clippers have had a disappointing season. And I'm not doing this in terms of which one I think is... Gr- Actually, I'm going to give my own opinion of the reason, in, in order of reasons as to why. The first one to me is just the simple, obvious one. The lack of availability of the two best players in the team that have prevented everything because that is the first thing, at least for me. You might disagree on the ranking of the three things, but for me, that's number one, so I'm going to start with that. The second one that our coach that we had so much trust in, most Clipper fans, has had a bad season, objectively a bad season, and he has not maximized the roster this year. He's been amazing the first two years, but he has not been so good so far this year. And then the final one is certain players just playing below their worth and just not being able to play at the level that we wanted in terms of aspiring to win a championship. So let's start with the first one. The reason why I said that the Clippers were going to win 60 games before the season, obviously a little bit of optimism there. A little is an understatement. But I thought that we would have Kawhi Leonard for at least 60 games. That was the target I had for him and Paul George was for them to play at least 60 games. And I knew Kawhi Leonard would be on a minutes restriction at first, but I didn't think that he was going to get injured, re-injured just two games into the season. I don't know if that's them bringing him back too soon. We didn't really get much clarity as to what happened during that stretch. He played against the Lakers on opening, on opening night for the Clips. That was our opening night, not the Lakers. But he played in that first game. And then he played against Phoenix on our home opener. And then after that, he was out for about 10 games. That really hurt the start of the season because I did say that the Clippers should go 8-2 and in their first 10 games because they had a favorable start to the season in terms of schedule. And when nobody's built that chemistry yet, I shouldn't say chemistry because some of these teams have chemistry already. Like a team like Memphis, for example, they basically brought back the exact same team. So they have chemistry. It's more the rhythm. The confidence of a new season, you know, making sure that your three balls fall like it uh, like it's supposed to, your legs feel good, all that kind of stuff. You know, who gets out the gates running, who comes out the gates running first, sometimes can really just guarantee you a, a home court advantage slot, like the Golden State Warriors last season, starting the season 19-2. and two. 
And they, even though had a lot of injuries throughout the season last year, they still were able to secure that top three seed because of their start because they took care of an easy start and they let themselves get that rhythm so then on Christmas Day they could go and play a Phoenix and they've built that confidence by beating the teams that they're supposed to beat and come out and win. The Clippers didn't do that and part of it was because of Kawhi Leonard not playing and that just inherently makes things a lot more difficult. And then when Kawhi Leonard came back for three games, and one of which Paul George got injured against San Antonio. He also hurt his ankle. So that caused Kawhi Leonard and Paul George to be out at the same time yet again before they came back in early December against the Charlotte Hornets. And then PG's missed a couple games in between there as well. But Kawhi, thankfully, has had a nice run here besides the load management games where he's played. And that's another reason. It's not just the injuries. It's the load management. You know, I'd have to really go and check, and I will in an episode that, you know, an upcoming episode, I will go and check how many games Kawhi Leonard and Paul George were actually injured and how many were just precautionary slash load management. But the one that sticks out to me is when we got absolutely destroyed against the Denver Nuggets on national television, and they Ty Lue sits all the starters in the second half, and then you have a back-to-back the next day and you still rest them. That, to me, was just... I know Paul George was fresh off an injury, but Kawhi Leonard should have played that game at least. It was just disgraceful in my opinion. It's so overly cautious. And, you know, the the Clippers took their sweet time welcoming them back. And it's funny because whenever Paul George does come back, he always looks brand new, first or second game back. So I know they probably could bring him back earlier than they do. But that being said, I understand you know, riding on the side of precaution. You don't want him to get injured for the season. At least we still have them going into this last quarter of the season, and that could be the counter argument. But the point is, regardless of what your rationale is for them resting, for them being injured, the point is they haven't been available enough. I mean, let me ask a question to you, the audience. And I want you to help me go find this. What team won the championship in which their best player in an 80-plus game season, so that's not counting the two lockout seasons in 99 and 2012, that's not counting 2021 and 2020, what season did a the best player on a championship team play less than 60 games? I want you to find that. And I know everyone's going to say Kawhi Leonard in Toronto played 60. I said under 60, okay, specifically. That's the cutoff. That's why I said 60 games before the season. So as of now, let's take a look, right? The Clippers have played 61 games. Paul George has missed 17. I guarantee, and I hope I'm wrong, knock on wood, I guarantee he will likely miss three more before the season's over, which will put him at... Actually, no, he can. if he misses five games, five more games, then he can still end up at 60. If he misses six more games, he'll be under 60. So if he, if Paul George can play 16 out of the last 21 games, which he should, he will reach the 60 mar- games played threshold that I you know, laid out for him before the season started, and I'm very satisfied with that, especially because at the end of the day, regardless of your criticism of Paul George, he's played at an all-star level this season and was our lone representative in Salt Lake this past weekend. Then there's Kawhi, who has only played in 34 games, So he's missed 27 games. 27 games is a lot. If he misses five more games, he won't even make 50 games. So hopefully, I think he will. I think we only have like three or four back-to-backs left. I haven't checked. But it's around, it's between two to four back-to-backs. And Kawhi Leonard will miss one of, you know, a game in those. No doubt about it. So hopefully he can play 50-plus. I mean, he is coming off an, an ACL tear. So if he plays 50-plus and Paul George plays 60-plus, it still may be okay. But not having them each play 60 is tough. And it's tough to build chemistry because then that brings me into my next topic. That makes Ty Lue's job that much harder because it's hard to build chemistry with lineups. It's hard to build continuity, and it's hard to keep guys – confident when their roles are constantly changing and coming up i'm going to be going more in depth about why Ty Lu has kind of got it wrong this season and kind of is also a little bit of an understatement but before we do that fan duel 
The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet didn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. This week, I'm taking the Clippers money line on Friday night against Sacramento, and here's why. The Sacramento Kings are playing on Thursday night against the Portland Trail Blazers. They are going to be, you know, coming to L.A. on a back-to-back, even though the travel is not too far. It's still a back-to-back. The Clippers are extremely rested. I will be in the building, so that means they have a better chance of winning. (laughs) And the debut of Russell Westbrook will have everybody pumped it's gonna be a lot of energy in the building so i would take the clippers money line i also think if they're a team with championship aspirations they should know how big of a game it is for seeding and FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay so don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Okay, let's get right into it with Ty Lue. So Ty Lue coming into the season, I mean, I called him one of the best coaches in the league. I said I'd trust him no matter what. But if you remember, before this season began, I talked about that there's 11 players in the Clipper rotation that have a case to be playing. And those players were Reggie Jackson, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Marcus Morris, Ivica Zubats, Norman Powell, John Wall, Luke Kennard, Nico Batum, Robert Covington, and Terrence Mann. 11 players. Now, it's hard to play an 11-man rotation every single night. But the reason why every Clipper fan thought it wasn't a big deal was because when you always have players missing games, which the Clippers are used to having, and every team really is these days, It's amazing to have that kind of depth. You're not going to have all 11 of them healthy most nights. And so to start the season with Kawhi Leonard out, the choice was pretty obvious. And it's funny because those first two games that Kawhi played, it looked like Terrence Mann was the odd man out, which was just mind-boggling to me. And that just brings us to our first concern. Why should Terrence Mann be the one that sits out out of those 11? And it's a very clear answer. It's because Ty Lue, and we've learned over the course of the season, is an offense-first mind. He looks at things from an offense-first lens. And the Clippers, the whole talk about them going into the season is about the wings they had, switchable wings, and three-point shooting. But it comes from defense leading to offense. It comes from being a stifling defensive team. When people think of the Clippers, people that don't watch the Clippers, they say, oh, they have some of the best two-way stars in the league, and they have a bunch of two-way wings like Terrence Mann, Nico Batum, and Robert Covington. Well, we obviously didn't have Kawhi Leonard, so that changes a lot of things. But then that made Ty Lue play with like a starting lineup of Reggie Jackson, Norman Powell, Paul George, Marcus Morris, and Zoo. And then he played a full-on bench unit with John Wall, Luke Kennard, Nico Batum, Robert Covington, and Terrence. And it was just too small. It was just too small. And Norman Powell wasn't good starting. It just didn't fit him. He felt like he was forcing it. But that lasted very short. That was a good adjustment for Ty Lue to bring Norman Powell off the bench, and he's started a six-man-of-the-year campaign since then. So I'll give uh, Ty Lue credit for that. But I also think it was fairly obvious. And then after that, we had Luke Kennard come in the starting lineup for a bit, and he did okay. But the really big issue with Kawhi out was that Ty Lue would just run with three guards at once. And that was causing the Clippers to get switched on and make them play a lot of isolation basketball, which really resulted in a lot of Reggie Jackson, John Waller, Norman Powell just isolating at the top. And then you you really saw the weakness that the front office went wrong by not having a backup big. But from what I've been told, that's because of Ty Lue's offensive philosophy. He wanted, he was okay with no backup big. He didn't make it a big priority. He thought that the Clippers could get through the whole season with just one big. And you know what? I thought so too. I thought we really had to. I mean, I thought we really could, but we were wrong. You need a backup big in the regular season, absolutely. And you honestly do need it in the playoffs for extra insurance. But in the regular season, you really do need one because most teams do have a backup big. So when Ivica Zubats went to the bench, and mind you, I mentioned like the starters and how many games Kawhi and Paul have played. Ivica Zubats has played 59 games. That's a team high. 
out of 61. He's going to miss the Sacramento game with a, with a strained calf, which so I hope he gets well soon. Zubats only misses games when he's actually hurt. So he's only missed two games. Salute to Vitsa Zubats, so reliable. And then Marcus Morris, even though a lot of Clipper fans will give him a hard time, and you can say he's not had a good season, he started out really well, but then he's really tailed off the last couple of months. He's only missed eight games. So I also want to give Marcus Morris credit for his availability. And just for the record, before Reggie Jackson left, he played in 52 out of a possible 59 games. So one thing about Reggie Jackson and Marcus Morris Sr., the reason why they're the ones that led us to the playoffs last year, for the most part, is because they were available. And I have to give him credit for that. Actually, I made a mistake. If it's Zubats has not played a team high in games, Terrence Mann has with 60. So Terrence has played 60 games out of 61. He's only missed one. Nicholas, but like just I want to just read how many different starters the Clippers have had this season, and this will maybe let you know the situation. If it's a Zubats, Marcus Morris has started every game he's played. Paul George has started every game he's played. Reggie Jackson started 38 out of 52 games. Terrence Mann has now started 35 out of 60, so he's now started the majority of the season, which is nice to hear. Kawhi, 32 games out of 34, so basically besides those first two games, he has started every single one since. Nicholas Batum, only 11 a lot of those were with Marcus Morris out very recently. Luke Kennard started 11. Amir Coffey, 9. Norman Powell, 7. John Wall, 3. Moses Brown, 1. And then Brandon Boston and Musa have each started 1. But you can kind of scratch Moses, Brandon, and Musa. But yeah, that's a lot of different starters, right? Everybody but Robert Covington. That was what part of that 11 that I mentioned. I So I thought the Luke Kennard starting lineup wasn't bad. You know, Reggie Jackson, Luke Kennard, Paul George, Marcus, and Zoo. It wasn't bad, but the problem was that Ty went with the three guards way too much when it went to the bench. And you had three guards, none of which who were great defensively, and then no center playing behind them. I mean, that was just very foolish to me. That was just seeing things from an offense first perspective. And, you know, when John Wall, Norman Powell or Reggie Jackson, or Luke Kennard, or beat off the dribble, you got Robert Covington or Nico Batum as rim protection. I mean, that's not going to cut it. And then Terrence Mann was getting less minutes than everyone. I mean, that was just mind-boggling. I don't understand what that guy needs to do to guarantee, like, guarantee himself a spot going into a season in the rotation. It's like he constantly has to work for his minutes. But other guys like Marcus Morris and Reggie Jackson can have slumps, can do nothing besides score the basketball, and they just have a guaranteed spot no matter what. It just shows you the lens that Ty Lue views things at, and I don't think he's maximized the roster with that mentality this season. And I'm really, really anti-criticizing coaches because I don't think I'm a person that could coach in the NBA. I don't think I know more about basketball than Ty Lue, but... The front office themselves have disagreed with Ty Lue this season. And they keep, Lawrence Frank keeps talking about wings, wings, wings. And, you know, I, I've heard that they pushed for Terrence Mann to be in the starting lineup. Ty Lue needed convincing for that. So that's also a little concerning. But eventually he did put Terrence Mann in the starting lineup. And with Kawhi Leonard, the Clippers have looked better even though we also had another problem before the new year, which was Terrence Mann not closing games. Honestly, not until the new year, really all the way up until February with Terrence Mann not closing enough games. And then, you know, to really top it off, I'd say the moral of the story is was the small guards. He stopped doing the three guard thing a couple weeks back, and then the next thing was just playing Reggie Jackson and Marcus Morris too much. And that's why the front office really had to step in and trade Reggie Jackson because... Ty Lue initially sat him, and then John Wall got hurt, which let Reggie come back into the lineup. And he was playing okay before he got traded. He was playing a little bit better when he was, you know, he knew he was coming off the bench. But his whole morale changed, his whole demeanor changed. And as I've mentioned multiple times, he really stopped being the Reggie Jackson with fun and joy that we became so accustomed to seeing here in LA and with the Clippers. So I think it just soured. Ty Lue saw what was going on. It took him way too long to see it, but he saw what was going on. And, you know, a lot of fans will also complain that John Wall didn't get a chance to start. And from what I know, John Wall was going to. Had the Clippers not made the deals, John Wall was going to start when he came back because he was get, just getting off a minutes restriction. But I guess the front office just, you know, didn't really like the fit. And the front office, the moral of the story is they want the Clippers to play with more wings. They don't necessarily think the Clippers need a traditional point guard, but Ty Lue 
has. And that is the the main reason why Ty Lue was so persistent with Reggie Jackson. And in my opinion, it did cost us games. It really did. Playing Reggie Jackson so much more than Terrence Mann. And then Robert Covington, with everybody healthy, has been the 11th man that is now out of the rotation. Even when a Luke Kennard was missing, he went nine deep instead of playing Rocco. So the underutilization of Rocco, the disrespect, and yes, in my opinion, it is disrespect to Terrence Mann because what he's done on the court complete, and in the playoffs in the biggest moments for our franchise warrants him playing over guys. And then his, you know, Marcus Morris' persistence is now the last domino. Other people have had problems with X's and O's and all that, but I disagree with that. I think Ty Lue's been running the same plays he's been running all three years, and it's really about the players executing them to the best of their abilities. But overall, yeah. That's the main story with Ty Lue. It took him a long time to play Terrence Mann a lot more, to really give him 30 minutes plus every single game. It took him way too long to put him in the starting lineup, and it took him way too long to stop playing three guards at once, and he still hasn't fully leaned into the wing-heavy approach. So in my opinion, second to the lack of availability of the Clippers' stars, Ty Lue having a disappointing season is a big reason why this team is only five games over 500, even though we had championship expectations. But coming up, going to be talking about the last domino, the players themselves on the court. Which ones have performed up to standard so far and which ones have not? Going to be talking about that coming up. All right, let's close it out. And by the way, I still will have an episode on Thursday. I'm sorry, on Friday morning, Friday afternoon. I know this one's coming out late Thursday night, but... I'm giving you a little double dose. If you have a little excitement, the Russ roller coaster begins. It's going to be a fun, exciting day for Clipper Nation. Because at the end of the day, whether you like the Russ move or not, there's going to be a lot of cameras, a lot of people watching. This is a former MVP, one of only three NBA regular season MVPs that have ever played for our franchise with Bob McAdoo and Bill Walton. The only one that studded in the 21st century. He's averaged a triple-double four times, and he is now the second top 75 player on the team joining Kawhi Leonard. So I'm so excited to see it. He's also the best point guard from an objective standpoint that Kawhi and Paul George have had here. But is he the best fit? That's what remains to be seen. Let's get into the team. So... I'm going to go through the players individually, and I'm going to talk about who I think has had a good enough season and who hasn't. Let's start from the bottom. Jason Preston. He's only played 13 games, and he's the sign of the Clippers throwing in the towel, so no comment on that. But actually, I'm going to say this. When Jason Preston played against Cleveland in that game where the Clippers just got schlacked, he showed me that he is going to be an NBA player. He just maybe needs the opportunity before teams don't realize that he's actually good. But Jason Preston is going to be an NBA player. He's got really good court vision and honestly a higher basketball IQ than any person that we had playing the point guard throughout the season, in my opinion. Although John Wall, yeah, you know, here's the thing. John Wall has a high basketball IQ, but right now he's having a hard time realizing he's really still not that dude. And I really like John Wall. Always have. Musa Diabate. He's only played in 17 games and he's averaged only 10 minutes in those games. I think it's been a little underwhelming with Musa. I think that's mainly because we thought that he would probably be the backup center if Ty Lue had to choose, but it's been Moses Brown. It was Moses Brown for a lot more games. And I think Musa's extremely raw, but he does have the potential to be a really good offensive rebounder and shot blocker in the league. I think he just needs to bulk up a little bit. But the thing is, there's no better teacher than experience. So just playing 10 games, I can't say he's played well, but I'm not going to just say he's played awful. He's clearly not ready to play in the you know, for a championship contending team, rotation minutes. But you've got to let play, young players play through mistakes, especially young big men. And speaking of young big men, that brings us to Moses Brown, who played in 34 games to the Clippers, which is actually the same amount as Kawhi Leonard, eight and a half minutes played. He was decent in his role. I think you got what you expected out of him. If anything, I thought we got a little more out of him. I didn't think he was really going to play that much, and he actually played in pretty relevant games. He averaged 4.6 points and four rebounds. But I will say this, his per 75 or per 36 minute stats are probably like double double worthy, like double double numbers. So, you know, he he wasn't very good, but I don't think that's because he played below his standard. I think that's just because he's I don't know how long he'll be in the NBA personally, and I don't mean that in an offensive way, but if you can't guard in the pick and roll at all, 
just being a good rebounder won't be enough in today's game because rebounding is not the same emphasis that it once was from an individual perspective. From a team perspective, it absolutely is because you got to rebound to win games. But from an individual perspective, a lot of the long rebounds and, and rebounds in the league, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the lo- a lot of the rebounds in the league are now long rebounds that come kind of fall to anybody because it's not just, you know, falling around the basket or mostly falling around the basket. And then teams don't go for offensive rebounds the same way they used to because they get back in transition. So it's a lot of uncontested rebounds. So, you know, I think that Moses is going to have to develop his offensive game or just, uh, you know, get a little bit lighter on his feet. Brandon Boston has only played in 21 games. I can't judge him at all. He's only averaging 12 minutes a game, and I feel bad for the guy because he's really, really talented. He plays. He averages seven points a game when he does play, but it's not enough for me to go off there. And now for the 11. Actually, 12. Amir Coffey. Played in 40 games this season. Wow. Doesn't feel like that. Some of those are in garbage time, though. He's only. I mean, he, had, he started nine times, which is more than Norman Powell, funny enough. In his 14 minutes of play, he's averaging four points. The thing about Amir Coffey is he's just not been able to get any rhythm. He hasn't played consistently like last season. And he's shooting only 27% from three and 39% from the field. So you would say it's a down year for Amir Coffey. But there's a reason for that. It's not because he got worse at basketball. He's not playing. So you can't expect him to just play great when he comes on the court. Now to the eleven. Let's start with Robert Covington. He's played in 36 games. He only averages 16 minutes a night, five and a half points a game, four rebounds, and one steal and one block a game. His shooting splits are not as good as last season, not even close. 40.6% in the field, 33% from three, but 60% of his shots are threes. In my opinion, Robert Covington's actually had a good season when he's played. Offensively, yeah, his shot hasn't been like that, but I always say this, you can't expect role players that aren't sniper shooters to just come fresh off the bench and start hitting threes at a high percentage when they don't even know if they're going to be playing if they go 0 for 2 from 3. So it's not fair to Robert Covington. In my opinion, he's still that very good help defender with amazing hands when he does play. So in my opinion, Robert Covington's been fine. He has been criminally underutilized. And in my opinion, the fact that he's not said anything about it, he's been so professional throughout the whole thing and kept such a great attitude, just shows what a consummate professional he is. How about John Wall? John Wall was definitely below what people expected of him, but he was exactly what I expected. I said he, not on Locked On Clippers, but if because I was, you know, I was trying to find the positive spin. But if you actually go back and listen to my reaction on Dime Dropper when we first got John Wall, I said, I don't think he's that great anymore. And he was exactly what I expected. Honestly, he was a little bit better than I expected. I didn't think he was still that fast. But we just weren't the right fit for him. So to me, it was as expected. But for what people expected, no, because he's not that guy anymore. He's not good off the ball. And it's hard when, you know, you're not amazing on the ball anymore and well, he wasn't being put in lineups that maximized him per se he needed to be playing with a, a center more so he can play with the he can play pick and roll with them when they was playing with small lineups they were just switching everything and making him go one-on-one and sagging off five feet from him so it was not great Luke Kennard he played in 35 games he started in 11 he averaged 21 minutes a game averaged eight points a night and his shooting percentage is still really good. 46% in the field and 45% from three. I thought Luke had a down year compared to last year. But again, I don't think it was because he got worse. I think there's two main reasons. Actually, three. One, he had a little bit of a calf injury. And that just kind of, you know, hurt him twice this season. He missed games. Secondly, the constant not knowing if he's going to play or not. Just He had to fight for his minutes. And some games Ty gave it to him. Most games he did. Some games he didn't. He was starting to fall out of favor before he got traded. And again, that's tough. Last year, he had his spot secured. So he was hooping. But overall, Luke Kennard's still great at what he does. I think at times he looked worse defensively this year because he was playing again with a lot of guards. And, you know, when you have three guards to pick on, it's not very fun. Nicholas Batum. 57 games played, 11 started. He's averaging six points a game and four rebounds. And his shooting splits are 41% from the field, 38% from three. Now, most four of his five shot attempts per game are threes. So his shoot, his shooting is good. I mean, 39% is 
fire. I mean, I'll take that all day long. Thirty. I said 38%. Yeah, 38% is fire. We'll take that all day long. Nico still does great things. I think he is a step slower than last year. He has slowed down a bit. He's had more bad games. But he is still a fantastic player and an absolute piece to a championship puzzle, no doubt. So he's been what I expect. Not underwhelming really at all. And then, by the way, let me know if you disagree with any of these picks in the comments of what I'm saying. And then there's Reggie. Yeah, he wasn't the same. 11 points a game and his shooting splits, 42% from the field, 35% from three. Yeah, he wasn't very efficient last year, but the thing is when you play for a team with higher expectations, every single mistake is more magnified. And to me, at times, it felt like Reggie Jackson thought he was still playing with that team. You know, he needed to really be a catch-and-shoot player, and he still bit off more than he could chew. And when he wasn't making shots, which was a lot this season, because let's face it, he's getting older and he's been worked really hard the last two seasons. He plays every game. And when he's not making shots, he didn't really play defense, didn't rebound. So when you have a guy that when they're not making shots, they don't contribute elsewhere, it's going to be hard to play them. So Reggie Jackson, he was extremely underwhelming. We, I, it came to the point where we could not win a championship with him in the rotation. And going into the season... Obviously, when you have him on a team with championship aspirations, that means you believe that he can. And the front office agreed with me on that. And then the last five. Terrence Mann. I think he's been fantastic this season. He's averaging nine points, four rebounds, two assists. That's slightly below his points per game last season, but I think he's going to surpass it by season's end. His shooting splits are actually ridiculous. 52% from the field and 39% from three. He's improving every single year. You just need to stop treating him like he needs to prove it every single year that he's very good and should be playing. Terrence Mann's been awesome, especially lately. And then Norman Powell. He's been amazing. Honestly, just as good as I expected, but a little bit better. I'd say everybody I've named so far has either been as expected or a little bit worse. But um, Norman Powell, maybe you can even argue a smidge better. 17 points a game on 48.6% from the field and 42% from three. So Norm, and he's probably been our best player getting to the basket this season. So he's been as I expected, but maybe a little bit better. And then Marcus Morris, honestly, if you had asked me two and a half months ago, I would have said he's been much better than I expected because he started out the season with fresh legs and was hitting shots and was really consistent. And then he just kind of reverted to the old Marcus Morris. He's averaging 12 points a game to go along with four rebounds. He's actually our fourth leading scorer and he's shooting the ball 43 percent from the field which is not very good but 38 percent from three which is still which is still good he shoots five threes a game so about half his shots a little under half his shots are threes but that's not a good for field goal percentage 43 percent in 2023 it's not even though field goal percentage is not the best metric anymore considering the three ball true shooting percentages it's still not a very good mark so Marcus Morris, he's been underwhelming by a little bit. But I can't say that I didn't, I didn't expect that because I was the one saying I think he should have been traded to just consolidate. And that's why the Clippers traded Reggie and John Wall to consol and Kennard to make Ty Lue's job easier. But now it just became harder again by getting Westbrook. So, so much for consolidation with guards. And then the final two. Actually, I'm sorry, Zoo. He's been awesome. I think he's been even – he's been what I expected. Maybe a little bit better, honestly because he keeps improving. Double-double. No, nah, that's what I expected. 10-10. and 10. Great defense. It's tailed off a little bit as the season's gone on, but he's been as expected. Paul George, totally as expected. 23 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists. Kawhi, honestly, better than I expected. I thought it would take him a little bit longer when he, in terms of when he was playing. Like it, I, think it, I thought it was going to take him more games to look this good, but he missed a lot of games. But that doesn't help your rehab when you miss games, when you get re-injured. So Kawhi has actually impressed me, to be honest. The fact that he's shooting 51% in the field is like, whoa. <laughs> he's already shooting better than Paul George. 50%, sorry. 50% of the field and 38% from three now. He's shooting only 0.2% worse from three now, and he was shooting 13% at one point. Remember? That's amazing the way he's worked it back. So I'd say the only people that really impressed me have played a little better than expected, Kawhi and Norm by a little bit. Everyone else has been up to standard or below. So that lets you know. And obviously everything I mentioned before, Ty Lu, the lack of availability. But that's why the Clippers have struggled so far this season. But that does not mean that they can't 
push forward. And on the next episode, I am going to be talking about what it's going to take, the biggest keys to close out the season strong and get a top three seed and preview the Friday game against the Kings, which will be Russell Westbrook's debut as a Clipper. Thanks for making Locked On Clippers your first listen today. Now make your second listen game to game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. The age-old proverb continues, Go Clippers!